Good morning, church. Turn in your hymnals to number 245. Eliza Hewitt was a school teacher in her um, early life, but she was struck by a heavy piece of slate by one of her students and became invalid. And was that uh, in that condition for an extended period of time. But she made use of that time by searching for God and Christ. And as she read the scriptures, she found that all the promises of God were fulfilled in Christ. And as she found one that excited her, she found another that excited her more. And she got very excited about that revelation. It was at that time that she wrote this hymn, More About Jesus. Let's sing together more about Jesus. to number 186, I've Found a Friend. While the title of this song is I've Found a Friend, the author aptly lets us know in the second phrase, he loved me ere I knew him. So it was Christ that looked for us and found us. Let's sing together, I've Found a Friend. i found a friend, oh, such a friend. Save me, and not alone the gift of life. 
Turn in your hymnals to number 317, Lead Me to Calvary. The author of this song, there is not a lot known about her. Um, she was a Quaker, but she draws us to remember the cross. And especially in the tech, in the chorus, uh, Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. It's Calvary that shows Christ's great love for us. Let's sing together.
Welcome, everybody. Glad you're here. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. If you're a guest here today, we are so glad you're here. Come again soon. Join us each Saturday morning as we worship God on His Sabbath day. And uh, for those who are watching online, wherever you are, uh, thank you for tuning in. And we hope you'll join us each Saturday morning at this time as we worship together here at the Yakima Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, we'd like to, I'd like to invite you to just take your uh, program, your bulletin, and uh, see what's happening. Uh, there's a lot happening, and a lot that happens in this active church beyond what happens here on Sabbath morning. So we have Sabbath school, of course, and we'd like to encourage 100% participation in Sabbath school. If you're a church attender, consider making Sabbath school part of your Sabbath morning too. That's time when we uh, fellowship, a time of Bible study, a uh, time of getting to know other church members in a way that we uh, don't during a worship service. Uh, we have c still time to join in with the Guard Your Heart seminar. We had a great start this last Tuesday night, and they're going to be doing a retesting uh, of... Uh, so you can still get in on the pre-test as you come about 6 o'clock this Tuesday evening. Also, we are just coming up on a season of prayer throughout our conference and here in our church. We'll be talking more about that, but it's entitled Vertical 24-10 Prayer Experience. And we'll... There's some information there for you. We'd like to invite everyone to be a part of this, a time when the church comes together for prayer. Uh, there's three prayer meetings with singing uh, in the youth chapel this next Friday night, Saturday night, and the following uh, Sabbath evening as well. And so each of those are at 6.30 in the youth chapel. We hope you can be here and uh, enjoy this time of prayer and united prayer together. Journey to Bethlehem, that's a big project. If you have not told Debbie Gilbert that you're willing to volunteer in some way or another, let her know this week, please. She's trying to fill all the slots and there's really a need for, for as, as many volunteers as possible. Uh, often we have uh, as many as 200 volunteers and we do not have all the slots filled yet. Um, also, uh, donations for the Spokane area fires. Now, we've been talking about fires in Maui and other challenges around the world, but right here on our own back doorstep uh, in the fires that were in the Medical Lake area fires around Spokane, and just in the last few weeks, those fires destroyed over 300 homes. That is a serious disaster and a catastrophe for those families affected. Some of those families who lost their homes in that fire were members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So if you want to help, reach out, make a difference as these people are trying to rebuild their lives, uh, there's a, uh, a, a website to go to where you can donate online. Or you can just simply write on an offering envelope and put on it, uh, I think it tells you right here, UCC Fire Response. Drop it in the uh, uh, offering box there in the foyer and your donation will go to help someone rebuilding their life. Uh, we have a church social coming up September 30, the Cowboy Chili Cook-Off and Vespers. We'll be talking more about that later. Should be a lot of fun and good food. And nominating committee. We have a second reading for these names. Uh, food Bank Distribution Manager, K Gary Karpenko. Food Bank Office Managers, Fred and Jackie Thompson. Uh, Yakima Adventist Christian School Board members, Kit Case and Maureen Kim, Teen Sabbath School Coordinator, Tiffany Stratty. Uh, this being a second reading, do we have a motion that, and a second that we approve of these names for these offices? Okay, we have a motion, a second, okay. Uh, all in favor say yes. yes. Opposed say no. That's carried. It's unanimous and we appreciate each one's willingness to help and serve here in our church. Let's make this a morning of praising God from our hearts, experiencing what real worship is, a worship from our heart, 
praise to God, learning from his word. So let's continue our praise this morning, hymn number 15, My Maker and My King. Let's stand together. with me as we pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for knowing our names, for loving us individually, for gathering us together in a church family, for this fellowship that is a preparation for heaven. We thank you for your protection and guidance. We pray for those who have lost homes and even family members in fires and disasters and pray for your coming to be soon to restore all that has been lost. We thank you today for the opportunity to worship our Savior who has given all for us. And we just lift up our hearts to say thank you, praise the Lord. His mercy endures forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Our gifts of love today is for the world budget. And we collect uh, the funds outside in the foyer. You can deposit them in the uh, box that is there for uh, offerings and also for the ties. If it's possible, let's bow our knees in, to seek our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come together on your holy day to worship you. You are our creator, redeemer, and you alone deserve our adoration. We appreciate the many things you have done for us in the past week, your protection, guidance, and even reprimands. We have to acknowledge that we have fallen short of expectations many times, and we are really sorry for it. Please give us the strength to become more like you, to be better witnesses of your character. Heavenly Father, strengthen our faith. Grant us more wisdom and understanding of your word and more compassion for our fellow human beings. 
We pray also for all members who are afflicted by sickness, doubts, and unemployment. Be the rock of their lives. And so we want to invite you to be among us as we worship you today and send us the Holy Spirit in a mighty outpouring. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. All right, boys and girls, why don't you just jump right out of your seat, go right to the back of the aisles, quickly collect the donations that are being made for the Yakima Adventist Christian School Scholarship Fund and sit on the front bench because we are gonna try again this week for a amazing little nature video. Okay, let's watch a fishy story and see what God has created. Attracting attention is an essential part of winning a mate. The world's oceans are filled with brilliant colors, all designed to make their wearers conspicuous. Unfortunately, this small Japanese pufferfish is dull, almost to the point of invisibility. But to compensate, he is probably nature's greatest artist. 
To grab a female's attention, he creates something that almost defies belief. His only tools are his fins. In his head, a plan of mathematical perfection. He plows the sand, breaking it up into the finest of particles. These shells aren't just rubbish to be removed. He uses them to decorate the bridges of his construction. He can't rest for more than a moment, but must work 24 hours a day for a week, or the current will destroy his creation. A final tidy up, and his masterpiece is complete. in nature does an animal construct something as complex and perfect as this. If this doesn't get him noticed, nothing will. Let's give the creator some thank yous on that one. Okay, boys and girls, how many of you think that fish had to take art lessons to do that? No, never took art lessons. How many think that he had to go to school to learn how to create that beautiful sculpture? No, he didn't. Then how did he know how to do it? How did he know how to do that? He learned by himself, but he, he never went to school to learn. What? Found a meat in that whale. Yes. God somehow put it into his little brain smaller than the size of a pea. Exactly how to do that. And he doesn't even know exactly what he's doing. He's just doing what God has showed him how to do. Isn't that amazing? We have a wonderful creator, and that creator gave you... Life. So, be happy that Jesus is the source of life and our creator. You can go back to your seats as soon as you get your paper. Good morning. I noticed there was not a title in the uh, bulletin for the song that I'm playing. It was just a little last minute. Um, I'm going to be playing a very simple 
uh, variation of the hymn, Crown Him With Many Crowns. And I would encourage you to follow along with it. It is a beautiful hymn. It has beautiful words. It is hymn number 223. I'm sure many of you knew that already. But if you would like to pull out your hymnals, it's hymn 223, Crown Him With Many Crowns. You know, there's something fascinating about when something is anonymous, like, who wrote that? Why didn't they put their name on it? Uh, we don't know who was the poet or who was the composer of this song, but it's become one of the best known Christian songs. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And it goes on. And uh, this African-American spiritual was probably first sung on a plantation uh, by slaves as they worked without pay or as they sat around a fire at night after a 12-hour work day. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me. O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Thea Bowman notes, 
When slaves met or congregated, they consoled and strengthened themselves and others with sacred song, moans, chants, shouts, psalms, hymns, jubilees, first African songs, and then African-American songs of their experience. And in the crucible of separation and suffering, the spiritual genre was formed, end quote. The first printed edition of this song was in the book, hymn book, National Jubilee Melodies, published in 1916, over 100 years ago. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. How many of you have sung that song? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Almost everyone here has sung that song. And uh, the truth is we all need prayer, right? We need to be prayed for, and we need to pray for others. And, uh, you know, prayer is the, the, the 50G wireless connection to God. Uh, prayer is the emergency button to heaven. You know, prayer is our lifeline when we're trapped 500 feet down in a cave. Prayer is the only way that self-focused humans can accept the gift of God's love and salvation. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer. That last quote was from Steps to Christ, page 93. Last Sabbath, we entered into a joint research project. Remember? Uh, turn in your Bible to Ephesians 6, verses 17 and 18. And uh, let's just uh, look at that once more. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And we also studied Ephesians chapter 6 in our Sabbath school study around the world today. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Praying in the Spirit. We don't talk much about praying in the Spirit. I don't believe I've ever heard a sermon about praying in the Spirit. Uh, maybe that's just something that Seventh-day Adventist Christians don't talk about. But since it's right here in the Bible and seems to be a part of a command to pray in the Spirit, last week we decided together that we were going to research this together and see what we could find and discover. And I'm, I have done some study in it. I'm sure many of you did as well. What is praying in the Holy Spirit? Is it speaking in tongues or, or praying in some heavenly language of heaven? No. Why? Because chapter 2 of Acts makes it clear that 120 believers who received this miraculous spiritual gift of tongues or languages... They received this gift for a particular purpose on that particular day, and that purpose was so that the pilgrim foreigners that were thronging Jerusalem for the feasts, thousands and thousands and thousands of them from all over the Roman Empire and all over the Parthian Empire, so they could understand the gospel in their own language the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Acts chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak how? In his own language. I don't know if we're able to uh, switch the uh, uh, text on the screen to the New King James Version easily or not, but if so, that would be great. 
uh, Parthians, the Parthian Empire, and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya and Cyrene, parts of Afri Northern Africa, visitors from Rome, capital of the empire, both Jews and proselytes, converts to Judaism, Cretans from the island of Crete, Arabs from the uh, Arab uh, deserts to the east. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Wow. That is what the gift of tongues is in the Bible. It's a miraculous gift to be able to speak another language. My daughter Carissa wishes she had that gift in C Cambodia right now. She's teaching uh, full time, uh, six classes a day, and uh, she's doing pretty well with the uh, 11th and 12th graders in our Adventist school in Siem Reap in Cambodia uh, because they all speak quite a bit of English. But the fifth graders, they don't speak much English, and she doesn't speak hardly any Khmer, and so um, I guess there's gonna be learning on both sides, wouldn't you say? Uh, if the Bible commands the Ephesians and all believers to take the word of God as a sword and pray always in the spirit, shouldn't we find out what it means to pray in the Holy Spirit? So I took the challenge seriously, and uh, let's see what we can discover. I discovered three main aspects of what the Bible's talking about when it talks about praying in the Spirit. Now, I'm sure that there's many other things that we could discover, but let's look at those three that seem to be very important because there are a number of passages in Scripture that talk about praying in the Spirit. Uh, praying in the Spirit means First, inviting the Holy Spirit to take charge. Second, it means claiming the Spirit's power. And third, it means praying as Jesus would pray. So how do we invite the Holy Spirit to take charge? Well, Galatians 5, verse 16 and onward. Let's go there. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, And I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's drop down to verse 22 through 25. Chapter, verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Okay, so there's some hints right there. Seems like walking in the Spirit is connected with uh, living in the Spirit and praying in the Spirit. Of course, the Spirit here is talking about the Holy Spirit and we certainly don't want to some other kind of spirit to be taking charge in our lives. Amen? <laughs> the root of praying in the Spirit is walking in the Spirit. The root of praying in the Spirit is, is living in the Spirit. So we could say it another way. Praying in the Spirit is the fruit of living in the Spirit. So look again at verse 22. These fruits of a, of a spirit-filled life. Uh, question for you. Are these fruits, there's quite a list there, and they're very delicious and nice fruits, right? I like these fruits. Uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, and so on. Self-control. Uh, are these a perfect description of you? I mean, honestly, could you say, you know, this, that's me. That, that's, that's me right there. That, that's me. Um, I can't say that honestly, that that's me. In fact, none of us naturally act and think this way without something from God changing us completely, right? That's, so, uh, you know, 
To be Christ-like, we must ask God through the Holy Spirit to give us a new heart, a new birth, a new nature in order to love God with all our hearts, to love others, to keep His commandments, to be able to share His love with others. We need a new heart. It's not something we are naturally born with. And then we can produce the fruits of the Spirit. No wonder it's called the fruits of the Spirit. It comes from the power of the, and the transformation of the Holy Spirit in our lives. May God grant us these gifts, these fruits of the Spirit in our lives because they will make a total difference in our homes, in our school, in our church, in our valley. These are descriptions of what Jesus is like. If you want to be Christ-like, and we all do, then this is, this is the template right here by God's grace. And the same is true for praying in the Spirit. While this is commanded for all of us, it says always, we don't do this naturally. We do not naturally pray, and we do not naturally pray in the Spirit. We don't have the ability to do that of our own. So what can we do? We must invite the Holy Spirit to take charge every morning. What do you say? Through, through His divine power, the Holy Spirit, we can walk in the Spirit. We can walk in the Spirit and we can pray in the Spirit throughout each day. That's God's goal for us. That's Christ's he modeled that. He wants us to follow his example in that, to be filled with the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, to pray in the Spirit. Now, to be able to pray in the Holy Spirit, we must invite God's Holy Spirit to take charge of our prayers and our prayer time. Now, we don't usually do that. We need to start doing that. When we start our prayer time each morning, we need to say, God, through your Holy Spirit, would you come and just take over this prayer? I don't know what to pray. I don't know how to pray. I don't even know what I should pray for. Would you take over right now as I pray? And he will. And we might pray each morning something like this. Dear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I really don't know how to pray. Spirit-filled prayers. I don't even know what I should pray about or pray for. So I give you permission to take control of my prayers and my life today. I lay all my plans at your feet. Please stay with me throughout this day. Fill me with your actual presence. Thank you, Lord. Amen. When we pray a prayer like that in your own words, Something different happens in our prayer life. Something happens in our daily life. It's not really complicated. Just consecrate yourself to God, your life to God, even your prayer life to God each morning. Now, some of us, with our rushed and busy schedules, and we didn't get to bed quite as early as we thought we would, and we're just off in the morning, and we sometimes even leave the house without even praying. Or it might be like that one-minute prayer on the run. Folks, that's probably not praying in the Spirit. God wants us to have something richer, fuller, better than the one-minute prayer. So, you will be amazed at what God will do in your life through His Holy Spirit, if you invite Him in, even into your prayer life. Now, isn't that what it says in Romans 8, verses 26 through, and going forward, verse 27 and 28? Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 28 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. We don't? Oh, okay. We don't know what we should pray for. 
We don't even know what to say. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings, with emotions which cannot be uttered. Now, verse 27, he, God, who searches the hearts, knows what is the mind of, what the mind of the Spirit is. So God the Father has a mind. The Holy Spirit has a mind. God the Son has a mind. That should tell us something right now that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not the same person, right? There are three distinct persons in one Godhead, one family. The God the Father knows what the God the Holy Spirit is thinking. That's what it says here, right? Because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, verse 28, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Does anyone want to say amen to that? Everything works out for good. Not everything is good. You're going to have some tough times too, like everybody else. But God takes and takes all these things in consideration, and he is the one directing your life, and you're walking in the Spirit, and you're praying in the Spirit, and God is able to work everything out for good. For good. We need to just really grab hold of that promise because there's many times in our lives when it does not seem that things are going good. And we are wondering, does God even hear my prayers? God is able and will make everything work out for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Praise God for that. That is amazing what God can do. What a gift this is. What a promise. Let's claim this promise, especially when things are not going well. Now, at your invitation... The Holy Spirit will take charge of your prayer life, give you a hunger for a real conversation with God, and will actually intercede with God on your behalf. You know, when you hire somebody to be an intercessor in uh, this world, we usually call it a lawyer. And it costs quite a bit of money to get to hire someone to be an intercessor. Friends, God's intercession is absolutely free. What do you say? Absolutely free. And he's the best intercessor you could ever, ever imagine. And so, what will be the result? What will be the result of a life that's been taken over by the Holy Spirit? What we just read. All things will work together for good for you who love God. Praise God. Now, what is praying in the Spirit? It is first inviting the Holy Spirit to take charge. Charge of my life, charge of my prayer life. But it's more than that. It's also claiming the Holy Spirit's power. Acts 1.8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 talks about the early Christian church. It says, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the what? End of the earth. That's where we are. Yakima, the end of the earth. Here we are on the other side of the world. Here we are, a fulfillment of this prophecy. The message of Jesus is going worldwide. There's, unfortunately, still millions of people who have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. So God help us make that part of our prayers, that those who haven't heard will still hear. Now, in the eighth volume of the book, Testimonies to the Church, page 191, it says, we need daily the baptism of divine love. We need daily the baptism of of divine love. The Holy Spirit brings to us this divine love. Acts chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. And all, all these, 120 or so, all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120. So I'm just picturing this. You know, this upper room can't be very big. Uh, 
it could be maybe about as big as our youth chapel, and that might be a stretch. That might be a stretch, but it could maybe be about that size. And uh, this is now after Jesus has risen from the grave. The disciples have actually seen him with their own eyes lift off the ground and return to heaven. And Jesus told them to go and stay in Jerusalem until they received power from on high. And 120 people are packed into this upper room, the same upper room that Jesus and his disciples had had the Last Supper in. Very possibly the very spacious home of a Christian believer who was the mother of John Mark and a relative of the Apostle Paul. 120 people packed into that room, people who love Jesus. They're packed into the room. What are they doing every day? They are praising God. They are praying, it says. And they are, they, they're praying for what? They're praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So they pray the first day, and different ones are praying around the room. Hours go by. They're still praying. They take a break. They come back. They're praying some more. Some of them are actually sleeping in this room. Some of them have their homes in other places in the city. The sun goes down. They come back the next morning, early. They share food together. They start praying again. This goes on for day after day after day. What are they praying for? They're praying for prayers of repentance. They're praying for the forgiveness of their sins. They're praying for, that Lord God would forgive them for being so hard-hearted and not recognizing that Jesus was the Messiah for so long. They're praying for each other. They're praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do we need the Holy Spirit? Do we need the Holy Spirit as much as the early Christian church needed the Holy Spirit? Yes, we need the Holy Spirit more than the early church. Our task is greater that we've been assigned. The world in this day and age, Satan knows that his time is short. The Bible says he's going about like a roaring lion. The closer we get to the second coming of Jesus, the more he is battering against the church and God's people. We need the Holy Spirit. Our world is in decay. We need the Holy Spirit. So let's press together. What do you say? Let's press together in meaningful times of united prayer. Praying in the Spirit means claiming the power of the Holy Spirit for transformation in my life and transformation through me and through the Holy Spirit in the lives of others. I can't transform anybody, but the Holy Spirit, I can pray for others, and the Holy Spirit can transform their lives as well. Now, this may surprise you, but prayer is really not powerful. Prayer is not powerful. Prayer of itself actually has no power at all, but it is a tool that connects us with God's unlimited omnipotence. Amen? That's where the power is. The power is not in us praying. It's not in the words we say. The power is in God, and we, prayer is just a tool to connect with God. So prayer is like a wrench. I should have brought a wrench here. Some of you have a, we all, a lot of us have wrenches in our cars. Here's a wrench. Okay, a wrench. Now, there's nothing really powerful about a wrench, right? But in the hands of a skilled mechanic, that wrench can do some very powerful things, right? So the wrench is a tool in the hand of an expert, and it's used to transfer the mechanic's wisdom and strength to fix the engine and propel that car forward. So claiming the Spirit's power that God has promised us includes praying with intense earnestness, earnestness. Let's pray in the Spirit and let God propel us forward. What do you say? Now, claiming the Spirit's power includes praying with intense earnestness, energized for alertness and perseverance in prayer. I need to grow in these areas. How about you? 
earnestness, perseverance in prayer, love for others. Ephesians 6.18 tells us how to pray, quote, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. NIV translation. The third facet of praying in the Spirit is pray as Jesus would pray. If Jesus was here on earth today, how would he pray? He prayed a lot when he was here on earth, didn't he? He, he, was, uh, he, he lived a life of prayer. He prayed in the Spirit. Inspired author Ellen Harmon White writes this in the book Prayer, page 219. Pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus. Interesting. Pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus while we believe his promises, rely on his grace, and work his works. So prayer is never isolated by itself. It's always part of a package of connecting with God, communicating with God, and co-working with God. Pray in the mind and spirit of Jesus. So she adds this other insight, quote, Christ intercedes for us in heaven. The Spirit intercedes for us in our hearts. Isn't that interesting? We have two comforters. Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. Those two comforters are our two intercessors. God cares that much about us that he gives us two intercessors. Christ intercedes for us in heaven. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us in our hearts. So we need to pray the prayer that the disciples prayed. And what is that prayer? Lord, teach us to pray. Turn in your Bible to Jude chapter 1, verse 20. There's only one chapter there. But uh, Jude, verse 20. Jude, verse 20. Jude verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, oh, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Who is this Jude? This Jude is a very humble person who wasn't always humble. This Jude was a man of faith who did not always have faith. This Jude was the stepbrother, the older stepbrother of Jesus Christ. And he did not like his kid stepbrother. And he thought he was a fake. And he was not about to think that his own kid stepbrother was somehow the Messiah. Absolutely not. You've got to be kidding. Even the miracles that he must have seen were not convincing enough. He certainly didn't want to get on the bad side of the Pharisees, let alone the Sadducees. But here now he's writing part of the Bible? How does that happen? After the resurrection of Jesus. Jude most likely was one of the 500 who saw Jesus in person on a mountain in Galilee. And his brother James had seen Jesus on the resurrection day in a special appearance to his, his brother James. And now these two, at least these two, and maybe hopefully the other two brothers as well, became believers in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and they gave up their lives as martyrs for the cause of Christ. And here Jude writes a letter and, and he says here, this is how we pray. Now, this is how we grow in Christ. How can we pray as Jesus prayed? Jude said, by keeping yourselves in the love of God. In other words, keep daily experiencing the limitless agape love of God. That's how we pray as Jesus prayed. And, th and that love builds us up, he says, builds us up in faith, faith in Jesus. 
and by praying in the Holy Spirit, he says, and looking eagerly for Christ's return, what we just read. The mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So how did Jesus pray? He prayed earnestly for his disciples. He prayed for strength to be victorious over Satan. He prayed also prayers of praise and thanksgiving. Sometimes he just, Jesus just bubbled over with thanksgiving to his Father. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 21. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 21. Here's Jesus praying. Now this is a prayer of Jesus that we don't really hear that much about. We've heard about the Lord's Prayer. But this is a prayer of Jesus recorded word for word. Let's see what he says. Verse 17. Then the 70 that he'd sent out on a missionary trip, two by two, returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Drop down to verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. Okay, now he's going to be praying in the Spirit. He's rejoicing in the Spirit. He's rejoicing in what the Holy Spirit can do. His prayer is being inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babies. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Wow, he is so excited. He's so thankful for what the Holy Spirit has done through these ordinary people. Seventy of them. They weren't even the 12 special apostles. They're, they're just others that have been following along with Jesus. And Jesus one day just said to them, hey, everyone come p p press in here. I've got something to tell you. Okay, I'm going to give you all assignments and I want you to go two by two and here's what I want you to do. Just go and go to other villages, other towns where we're going to be, where I'm going to be traveling and just tell them about Jesus, about the Messiah and the kingdom of God. And they went out not knowing exactly what they were going to do or what they were going to say, but the Holy Spirit took over, took charge as they prayed for the power of the Holy Spirit. How can we pray as Jesus prayed? Uh, these joyful prayers of praise and thanksgiving. And when we pray, let's praise God uh, for his amazing grace, for his great salvation. Let's thank him for new members in our church, uh, new brothers and sisters in Christ that who we can befriend and encourage. Uh, and let's praise God for our spirit-inspired Bible. I mean, what would we do? What would we be? Where would we be without the Bible? Oh, let's be reading it every day. Let's be taking it seriously. Let's let it encourage us and change us. Uh, the Holy Spirit, through the Bible, reveals hidden truths of God's plan for this world. And now let's review these three facets of praying in the Spirit, okay? You ready? Uh, let's review the meaning of what does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit, okay? The first one, inviting the Holy Spirit to what? Take charge, that's right. So say it with me, inviting the Holy Spirit to take charge. Okay, the second one was claiming the Holy Spirit's what? Power, the Holy Spirit's power. And third was praying as Jesus would pray. Praying as Jesus would pray. Praying as Jesus did pray. Uh, we're beginning a series of, a season of of united prayer here at our church. And uh, this is not just at our church, it's also throughout our conference, all Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho. Uh, it's called Vertical 2410 Prayer Experience. And there'll also be a, a follow-up. Um, there's posters on the bulletin board about a special prayer event, a prayer summit coming up uh, in October. But right now, 2410 prayer experience. Most of our life is on the horizontal, but we're now focusing on the vertical, our relationship between us and Jesus. And uh, so 
in this 10 days of special praying in the Spirit here at our church, uh, we're, we're going to be joining with others across our Upper Columbia Conference as well. It's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You know, if we sense our need of prayer and praying together, we will experience the blessings that God will provide in answer to united prayers. How can you be involved? I'm sure that each one of you want to be involved, and each of you can be involved. It, one, you can invite someone to be your prayer partner, maybe today before you leave church, or today, this afternoon, you can call somebody up. Ask someone to be your prayer partner and pray together each day for these 10 days, September 15 through 24. Now, you may want to start earlier than that. You may want to continue on after that. But these are the 10 days that we are joining with the rest of our conference in united prayer. Second, come join us. We're going to have three live on-site prayer and singing meetings in the youth chapel. This coming Friday night, Sabbath evening, the next Sabbath evening at the end of the 10 days, all in the youth chapel at 6.30 p.m. So come and join us. Come for a Vespers at the beginning of the Sabbath, at the, at the end of the Sabbath, and pray, praying and singing together, sharing scriptures together. And third, you can log on to the Upper Columbia Conference's 24-hour prayer Zoom room. And there's an uh, address there in your bulletin. You can go on to the, the link is listed there in your bulletin. You go on there and you can see lots of other ideas of ways and options that you have to participate actively in this time and this season of prayer. You know, I really believe that God is moving his church. Uh, if we just think that we can just kind of drift along and everything will be fine until Jesus comes, it's just not going to happen that way. It's going to be God's church really pressing together, focusing together, praying together, and working together. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. That's what the disciples said. That was really a prayer, wasn't it? That was a, a sentence prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. That was a prayer. Teach us to sense our need and to pray in the Spirit. You know, I'm thankful for our conference leaders who believe in the supernatural power of united prayer. What do you say? I'm thankful for our church here as we grow together in this prayer experience. I'm thankful for Jesus who promised the filling through another comforter, the Holy Spirit, if we ask. If we ask, Luke eleven thirteen. 13, if we ask, it's me, O Lord, not my mother or my father, but it's me, O Lord, standing here in the need of prayer. Do you sense that need today? Let's stand together as we pray. Dear Father in heaven, you are an amazing creator. You're an amazing God, God of amazing grace. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves us so much that he sent his Holy Spirit to change our lives, to change our church, to change our valley, to change our world. Lord, we want you, through the Holy Spirit, to take charge of our prayer lives. We want the Holy Spirit to come and fill us, to be actually in our hearts and minds, to give us the power we need to defeat Satan, to love others, to love God with all our hearts, to win others with that love. Lord, we thank you for your amazing example of prayer. The nights you spent in prayer. 
for us. We thank you. May we be part of the answer to your prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.